I do these for one main reason. I do a lot of workshops. The biggest reason is people don't know this stuff. So we're here to talk about health, what you guys can do to get healthier, implementing very small changes in your life that will not only improve the quality, but the quantity of life that you live. So do you guys think that it's possible to live 70, 80, 90, over 100 years? Yes. Do you think that you're capable of living that? Yep. Do you think that you're worthy of living that? Yep. Would you want to live that long if you felt like crap your whole life? No. So that's what we're here to talk about. We're going to go over three main questions. Oh, no. so number one, what's your most important asset? It's on the sheet. You guys can use that sheet. There's pens. You can write notes if you want to. Okay, so I'm not going to correct you, but I want to know what's your most important asset. Who wants to shoot out an answer? It's a health, health workshop, right? It's pretty obvious. So yeah, that's the first question. What's the second question? What is health? Anybody want to give an answer to that? So do you guys think health is how you look? We see marathon runners that look like they're in great shape. They drop dead from a heart attack. So are they healthy? How about how you feel? Just health how you feel. I feel fine. I know a lot of people who feel fine and get diagnosed with cancer, who have a stroke. So it's not how you feel. Health is how you function, number one, okay? F, X, N, if you wanna just shorten function, that's what we use. Health is function, remember that. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to work on improving your overall function, not just how you look and how you feel. That's a byproduct of how you function. If you function well, you will look good and you will feel good, okay? But function is a whole lot greater. So here we go, you guys ready? I always talk, uh, I always say that um, participation is transformation. So those of you that actually participate, you're gonna learn more. You're gonna be healthier as a result. So I'm giving away books right now. Whoever stands up and comes to get them, comes to get them, they're yours. Right now. These are books, these are books on health. I've actually I have stories in here that are written by patients in our own office. I can't, I'm not gonna run. Here, 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 here. <laughs> So those are just cool little stories that we put together. They're, uh, they're chiropractic stories, and they're not, uh, they're not about back pain, headaches, or neck pain. Okay, they're about a lot of things that people don't really know. They're about uh, people having improved digestion, improved immune function, uh, improved sleep, decrease in depression, decrease in anxiety. All these different things that people go, really? Chiropractic can do that? And it has nothing to do with chiropractic doing that. It's really how chiropractic improves the health of your body, and your body does the healing on its own. Okay, all right. So these are some of the stats. We're not gonna go over these a whole lot because this is really boring, but this is how many people died from cancer last year. This number is going up every year, just so you guys know. I think it was 611,000 last year, the year before. Okay, so everybody thinks that, oh sorry, that's hard to do, hard to do with 611. Um, but everybody thinks with all the advancements in, in uh, medicine, all these surgeries, all these new medications, etc., that we're getting healthier, we are getting sicker by the day. You guys know how much we spend on heart disease every single day? Take a guess. Who wants to guess? You'll see the slide after. A half a billion. What'd you say? A half a billion. Close. Quite well. Not really. Okay, so cancer, you know, 600,000 people, blah, blah, blah. Diabetes, 76,000 people every single year are dying from this. And it's going up. And it's not as easy as just taking a pill and everything will be fine. It does not work like that. That's what they have you convinced to believe because you watch these commercials now and like, you see people running through the field like this, right? They're all happy and there's nice music. It's like, oh, take this drug, you're not gonna be so much better. Side effects may include death, uh, you know, diarrhea, uh, increase for uh, suicide, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, wait a minute. Jeff Foxworthy does a brilliant skit on that, comedian, right? Um, and he talks about how he has itchy, watery eyes. That's it. And he's gonna take this pill and it, he goes on the, to talk about the list of side effects. He's like, wait a minute, like, these are just way worse than the actual symptom I'm having now. Why would I take this pill? So YouTube, if you get a chance, it's long so I couldn't play it, but. 
seven out of 10 deaths from chronic diseases. Chronic diseases are, are diseases that are actually preventable, okay? Diseases of lifestyle, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes. Just because your parents had that doesn't mean that you're doomed to have that. How many people believe that? You believe that you won't have that? I, I, I believe I don't, it, it's not a hard fact that I will have. Okay, good, okay, good, yeah. How many people believe that just because your parents had it, you'll probably get it? You're told to believe that, right? Because you have the gene. Now, genetics are, they're important to a certain degree, but now, you guys heard of epigenetics? Epigenetics is a new study that's showing that just because you have a gene doesn't mean that gene's gonna turn on and cause disease, like breast cancer. You have the breast cancer gene, you know? It's not that scary. So epigenetics talks about how the environment that you soak your body in will affect genetic expression. So that might sound complicated, but you guys know what stem cells are. Stem cells are neutral cells, okay? It's just a cell, it's not a bone, it's not a muscle, it's not a eye, it's just a base cell for your body. You can take a stem cell, and depending on which environment you place the stem cell in, that stem cell might decide to become a bone cell whatever, a muscle cell, a hair cell, etc. They have the exact same genes, but they become something different. So now the environment that you place your genes in, which is your stress level, how you exercise, how you think, all the chemicals you put in your body, your you know sleep, etc., that's what's gonna affect your, your genetic expression. That's what will cause cancer, stroke, diabetes, arthritis, XYZ. Yeah, the average person is on nine medications in the country. Pretty scary. We take 70% of the world's drugs and we're only 5% of the world's population. Also scary. Here's what we spend per day on heart disease. So you were close. It's half a trillion dollars per day. Yeah. You said half a billion. That's more than most people think, but half a trillion dollars on heart disease per day. Going up. Going up. So why don't we change? Answers. People. Why don't we change? Why is it that we see these stats going up, we know we're sick, and we still don't do anything about it? Lazy. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're stuck in your own ways. And there's no, there's no urgency because we base our, we think that our health is based on how we look and how we feel, and if we look and feel fine, then we think we're fine. That's why we don't change. So what is stress? Here's another one. Answers. What is stress? Yes. <laughs> what else? Work. Money, family, job are the top three stressors in the country. And um, here's, the, here's a few more. So here's the, uh, the one thing with stress is your body reacts the exact same way to every single stress out there. It doesn't matter if it's a mental or an emotional stress, or if it's a physical stress, or a chemical stress. It's all the same. Your body reacts the exact same way. And we're gonna get into that a little bit. So mental, emotional, this is a this is a big thing. Whenever you say, oh, you're stressed, people go, well, I don't feel stressed, right? Because you think that this is, this is the stress part, but it's the whole body. So there's all these things in the media you see that make you feel like you're insignificant, and you're not pretty enough, and you're not tall enough, or whatever it is. I mean, that you're just bombarded with that. I think you're exposed to I can't remember what it is. I think it's like 23,000 advertisements per day and you, you absorb like 200 of them. Don't quote me on that, but it's something like ridiculous. And most of them, are, they're all negative. It's not like, <coughs> you know, people are advertising say, don't buy our product, you're good enough. So what can you do to combat this stuff? This is what I do, okay? And I think it works pretty well. So all those little chalk drawings, that's on my driveway and that's my daughter. <laughs> So that's one way that's like a great stress reliever is drawing. That's Winnie the Pooh and his buddies. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> we drew that after Dallas. And uh, she loves ponies. And my wife comes and ruins them most of the time. <laughs> but free hugs, that was cool. Did you guys see that one? There was people walking down the street mm -hmm. saying, hey, I'm gonna give you a hug. Can I give you a hug? Just people like spreading love because they want to make the world a better place in their own little bubble which is awesome. Music is phenomenal for decreasing your mental and emotional stress. Not just the stuff that you used to listen to back when you were in high school, which can 
that can be helpful, but newer music, even though you might not like it, the way your brain actually responds to new things decreases your stress level. So you can go on Spotify or Pandora and just do a shuffle and listen on your drive home or if you're sitting in the chair. Um, spirituality, you don't have to be Christian, I put that up. Whatever it is that you want to do, if it's obviously for the better um, of, of humanity, then, then great, do it. Um, meditation, another thing, awesome. But what most people do is they feel stressed, they sit on the couch when they get home and they sit there for, most people watch an average of seven hours of television per day, which is proven to increase depression and anxiety and cause sleep disorders and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so stop watching TV. Watch a little bit if you want to, but really stay away from it. It's absolute poison. Okay, food, always a big topic of conversation. This is a tough one because you are hardwired, literally, neurologically hardwired to acquire as much calories as you possibly can, especially when you're under stress. Basically, your body goes into this state where it says, oh, I don't know how much I'm going to find here, so I better get it now before it's too late and other people. And that's why when people are under stress, it's easy to go through a drive through It's easy to order pizza, it's easy to order whatever it is that's quick, that's full of sugar, full of salt, no nutritional value whatsoever, and just makes you sick. Um, but really, I mean, two thirds of people now are overweight or obese. Well, two thirds are overweight, one third are obese now. And really, I mean, people don't eat food anymore. They eat empty calories, essentially. Just sugar, just carbs. You guys know that there are now 27, I think it's 27 million people that have been diagnosed with diabetes in the country, and like 56 million are pre-diabetic, which basically is diabetes anyway, All right? When people, I never like that term pre-diabetic, it's like you're, you either are or you're not. Oh, your sugar levels are unstable. You're pre-diabetic. No, you're diabetic. And people think it's just as easy. I can stick my finger. I can do whatever. And diabetes is all gone. But it's not. Diabetes will kill you. People lose limbs. I mean, all the time. And uh, it hardens your arteries, which leads to heart disease. And all of your organs need that blood. So if they're not getting it, it's going to lead to an increased, increased risk for other diseases. But let's talk about some of this. So some of the food myths. Red meat causes heart disease. Not true. Fish is a healthier meat. Not true. Calcium for bones. Nah, not really true. Cholesterol is bad. Not true. Fat makes you fat. Not true. Who's stunned right now? <laughs> they already know this stuff. They're, they're vets, like I said. Seasoned vets. <laughs> so red meat. This is why they tell you it causes heart disease. What do they feed cows? Should cows eat corn? No. No. What should cows eat? Grass. Exactly. So cows that are fed high corn diets, corn is an omega-6, it's a grain. They end up having a lot of omega-6s in their meat. Omega-6 is extremely inflammatory. So if you're, if you're eating a product that's loaded with omega-6, it inflames you and you get sick. And Americans are just, I mean, we eat a lot of red meat in general more than the rest of the world. So that's why the rate of heart disease is higher. But if you eat beef that's grass fed, low omega-6, high omega-3, no heart disease. Fish. If you eat fish that is wild caught, it's good. However, there are fish that are, you guys ever heard the term bioaccumulation? So large fish eat a lot of small fish, right? Like sharks, for example. So all the small fish have a little bit of mercury in them. That's the big scare of fish, especially in the ocean. But if you're a large fish and you eat a lot of little fish, mercury content is higher. Another reason why they tell pregnant women not to eat tuna or shark or things like that when they're pregnant, very high mercury content, neurotoxic. Um, and then smaller fish, most of them just kind of graze on, they'll eat plankton, they'll feed off coral and they'll do whatever so they don't have any mercury in their system hardly at all. Um, so some fish is healthy, yes, very healthy. Some fish, not so healthy. Now I love tuna, and well, I will say that's like one of my guilty pleasures, so I do eat it once in a while, um, but I definitely limit it. <coughs> and let me just say that I'm not perfect, so don't think I'm, I'm telling you that I am, okay? But I, I think everybody just needs to try to get closer to that. Calcium. Um, 
So calcium for bones, right? Everybody says take calcium, it'll build your bones up. Do you, you think it makes any sense if I were to just sit here like this and did nothing all day, just watch TV for seven hours like the average person does, and just kept pounding protein shakes? You think I'd grow like muscles like Arnold? Why not? I'm not using them. So bone is exactly like muscle. Bone is dynamic living tissue. Bone will remodel whenever you place excess stress on it. So tennis players that are right-handed always have a much larger humerus and bicep on the right side than the left. So that's the way to build bone. If you want to build bone, stop taking so much calcium. You need a little bit, but you get maybe more than enough calcium from your greens most of the time. So stop taking calcium, and uh, one of the best things you can take actually to make bone strong is saturated fat. So animal fat. Cholesterol is bad, I have a big slide on that. Fat makes you fat, not true. Um, I think I have a slide on that too, we'll go over that. So insulin brings your blood sugar down. Okay, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. It's one of the biggest reasons why people gain weight fast, even though they say, I don't really eat a lot. I don't know why I'm gaining weight, or I don't know why I can't lose weight. It's really all about insulin. Um, so, do you guys know what influences insulin the most? How it causes insulin to go like this, which is bad, by the way. Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, yeah, especially refined carbohydrates. The things that everybody loves, your noodles, your breads, okay? Things that affect the least protein. So if you're on a higher protein diet, very great for leveling off your your insulin levels, and that's when you start seeing weight fall off. It doesn't even have to be a high protein diet, it can just be a, a more uh, higher in protein, lower in carbs. Okay, so saturated fat is mainly an animal fat. So their steak, their butter, coconut oil is mainly saturated, and then um, eggs. But this is where, um, with fat and cholesterol, this is where people started saying it was bad. So like. Now back in the 1930s, I believe it was, there was a couple of Russian scientists that were doing um, experiments with fat in animals, and they were testing to see if it actually caused heart disease. They were using rabbits. They were injecting the rabbits with fat. The rabbits were dying from heart disease, and they said, conclusion, fat causes heart disease. Problem? Anybody? <laughs> Maybe, that's probably part of it. It says rabbits weren't getting any eggs. Rabbits are not genetically equipped to break down fat. They're vegans. We're not. You ever see rabbit eat an egg or a piece of meat? <laughs> they don't do it. They don't have the genes to do it. They don't have the enzymes in their in their gut to digest it. So if you do the exact same experiment, you do it on a carnivore or even an omnivore like a human, no heart disease from food. Okay, from fat. As long as it's not trans fat. Trans fat's the bad one. So that's the other. There's a lot of studies that were done on fat linking fat with heart disease, but really they were blaming saturated fat on heart disease when it was actually the trans fat causing heart disease. Do you guys know where trans fat comes from? Trans fat is when you overheat fats, especially unsaturated fats. So unsaturated fats are olive oil and, well, I mean, that's the main one avocado oil, grapeseed oil, and things, uh, safflower oil. But when you heat those up, they start breaking down and their chemical structure changes into a trans fat which will harden your arteries and kill you real quick. Even if you go to McDonald's or something, which you shouldn't, you're better off getting a burger than a thing of fries. But I love fries. I know you love fries. Cook them in peanut oil and not in bad oil. Okay? <laughs> Everybody loves fries. I love fries. Cool? Questions so far? After? Okay. Am I going too fast? No. Okay. Thank you. So, cholesterol. That's a big one. You hear that talk all the time. So, yes, it can block your artery, and yes, it can lead to a heart attack, but this is why it blocks your arteries. So, if you are under a ton of stress and your body is not healthy, your body is in a higher state of, it's called oxidation. You ever hear that word? And when you cut an apple open and it goes brown, so the apple is actually oxidizing, okay? The oxygen is breaking it down. So your body, same thing will happen to it. Under a lot of stress, even with your genes, they show that if you're under a lot of stress, your genes start to break down your, 
your telomeres and your DNA actually fall apart quicker. I know I'm using big words, but just believe me when I tell you that stress leads to oxidation, which leads to death really quick. So under stress, your body goes through breakdown. Your liver starts to release cholesterol because cholesterol is something that helps heal tissue. If I can cut my arm right now and I start bleeding, my cholesterol levels instantly go up. You know that? Instantly. Does it make any sense to lower my cholesterol levels to heal? Or so my arm, I uh, mean, to heal? That, that's the whole point of cholesterol going up. So whether it's a cut on my arm, or if it's heart disease, or if it's a stroke, whatever it is, cholesterol goes to the site of injury to help heal you quicker. Now, if you're under a ton of stress, and the stress never goes away, and the body keeps falling apart and breaking down on the inside, cholesterol keeps going up, and it keeps sticking to the wall of the artery to help heal, and it starts to oxidize, and cholesterol actually fluffs up when it oxidizes, plugs the artery, causes a heart attack, and then they go, hmm, take this pill for the rest of your life, and that's it. Now, in a state of, I don't wanna say emergency, but certain cases, statin drugs can save somebody's life. But if you put somebody on a statin drug for a long period of time without addressing the cause of the problem, which is mainly just lifestyle, then this is the kind of stuff that becomes effective. Your vitamin D levels crash, which is why they tell you to take vitamin D when you're on a statin. Your bile, so your digestion will actually start to get affected because your bile start, your bile salts aren't there anymore. Um, free radical damage, we talked about that, that's the oxidation thing. Your serotonin receptor, that's whenever you give somebody a hug or if you listen to a song you love or watch a movie and you laugh, serotonin goes up in your brain and that's what makes you feel so good, that's why you want to keep doing it. Breast milk is absolutely loaded, 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 loaded with cholesterol. So just common sense. If cholesterol was bad, wouldn't babies just die left, right, and center? Yeah, of course, absolutely. <coughs> so low cholesterol levels of that linked to depression, stroke, Alzheimer's, aggressive and violent behavior, and suicidal tendencies. So, um, it was about 10 years ago where they actually changed the normal values of what cholesterol was, and the number of people that were on cholesterol medication went up three times, two and a half times. But it went from like 20 million to 68 million in overnight, just because they changed the value of what was normal. So really, if you have high cholesterol levels, the first thing you need to do is not, what, what pill should I take? You can take it if it's urgent, but it's, okay, I need to make a serious shift in my life because of my body is just falling apart on the inside. This is just a slide that talks about how cholesterol levels are not influenced from your diet very much, very little actually. Okay, so obviously if you're on a toxic diet, that's stressful for your body, cholesterol levels could potentially go up, but it's not necessarily the food causing that, it's the fact that your body is so stressed from the diet. Okay, we talked about the myth busters, what am I supposed to eat? That's a funny slide, can you guys see that? <laughs> what am I supposed to eat? Uh, you can eat lots of great things. If you want this slide, I will email it to you, okay? It's just alternatives, what to eat, what not to eat. Toxins found everywhere, probably found on the floor here, uh, probably blowing around in the air. There's toxins everywhere you can avoid them. Doesn't matter how hard you try, especially in this country. There's pesticides all over the place, runs off from the crops into your own yard. If you're walking through downtown Chicago, you're breathing in smog, uh, lotions, soaps, air fresheners, etc. They are everywhere. Cool story with uh, toxicity and how it affects the body. We have uh, an office in Plainfield. Um, one of these, one of the staff members there was talking to you about how, how she hadn't had a period in it was like three years, and then she started getting like just heavy, heavy periods and it would not stop. So I started going through her whole history, and then we got to this topic of toxicity, and uh, she had air fresheners everywhere at her house in the office. And as soon as we got rid of the air fresheners, everything was normal. It was that simple. Wow. Okay, so sometimes the answer is easy. But um, what else do we have? Soaps. Soaps, if you mix with chlorinated water, not all of them, some of them, will actually produce dioxin in the water. Asian orange. You know what that is, right? Do you know that? Yeah, so there's some soaps now without uh, uh, triclosan, it's called. 
triclosan free soaps don't produce the dioxin in the water. You'll see that. Any of this info that you guys forget, you can write it down. If you forget it, just email me or call me. Okay? Uh, BPA in uh, water bottles, also another extremely, extremely toxic chemical. But it's really, uh, BPA leaches out of the plastic into the, into the water, whatever it is you're drinking, when it's heated up mainly. So a lot faster. If you keep it in there for a long time, it'll leach too. But now they have something else that's supposed to be just as bad. So if you can, try to drink things out of a Corona bottle rather than, not kidding, a glass bottle, <laughs> rather than a plastic bottle. Um, so this is, uh, it's always like a, a little bit of a controversial thing, but these are just some of the toxins. We have ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze, phenol, which is a disinfectant, formaldehyde, aluminum, thimerosal, and then we have antibiotics. Those are all found in vaccines, and it's not, it's not a vaccine debate at all. So there's pros and cons to vaccines, but you guys just need to know that these are not as good as you think. Like I said, there are toxins everywhere, and they all matter. Everything matters. Just some of the symptoms that um, toxins lead to. Okay, the list goes on. I'm sure you guys have heard of all those. You could probably even circle some of those for yourself. Artificial sweeteners. Aspartame, mainly. Sucralose is the new one that's supposed to be safe because there's no, not a lot of studies, I should say there's not that there's none, but there's not a lot of studies that are suggesting that sucralose is really harmful, but it's one of those things where just wait a couple years and you'll see. It'll probably be worse than aspartame. Exercise, we all know this is good for us and we all know that we don't get enough. How much exercise do you guys think we need every single day? Or is it every single day? How much do you think you need per week? 20 minutes. Okay, 20 minutes a day is good. Anybody else? 30 minutes, three times a week. So all the uh, research is pointing closer to an hour a day is what you need. Not just, yeah, I know it's hard, right? You have to squeeze it in. But the, I mean, the busiest people in the world exercise and bigger they can exercise, I can too. Um, but the great thing with exercise is uh, not only is it great for muscles and blood flow and everything like that, but it's great for your nervous system and your brain. So your nervous system actually requires movement to stay healthy. Your brain requires movement. That's the, that's the best thing for you. Even when you're developing as a baby, the more you move, you start crawling, you start walking, and that's when you start learning how to speak and you interpret speech and all these different things. Um, but there was a study done with just with depression so they had a group that just did exercise, a group that took medication with exercise, and a group that did just medication. Which group do you think had the least amount of depression? Exercise. Exercise only. So the whole point of an antidepressant, actually, it's supposed to have an effect exactly like exercise would on your brain. It's supposed to stimulate parts of your brain to make you feel less depressed, and all you have to do is move. Now, of course, you guys are hearing me say like, meds are bad, right? That's what you're hearing. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that medication is not always the answer. Fine, exercise. That's a good question. So, great question. So I hear this a lot when I, when I ask people like, well, do you exercise? They go, well, I have, I'm a laborer. I work a lot. Okay, fine. If I walk every single day for 60 days straight, you think on day 61 that walk is going to be challenging for me? Probably not so much, so what do I have to do? You have to constantly, constantly increase the intensity to make itself challenging and stressful to a certain degree. You have to make yourself sweat, you have to increase your heart rate, you have to increase your respiration rate. That's, def that's the definition of exercise. So even though you have a physical job, I have a physical job, I still have to do it. Because if I don't, I mean, I just kind of stay at that level and then over time, start to decline. So really, I mean, you're either going up or you're going down. There's really no, no in between. But this was Jacqueline at 71. You've heard me tell this joke like five or six times probably, right? But I could never let this go because it was like the coolest thing ever. So I met Jack when he was 93 in Vegas and healthy as a horse. And so I just asked him like, I need a secret. Tell me. I had like 30 seconds to talk to him. Not even. Like, Give me one secret. He goes, I have sex almost every day. I go, really? That's the secret. He goes, 
almost on Monday, almost on Tuesday, almost on Monday. Okay, so great sense of humor. And uh, yeah, awesome day. That's my baby. How much sleep do you think you need? Yes, yes. Seven to nine hours is what research shows. How many people in here sleep less than five? Yeah, I'm always on Wednesday. Why do you sleep less than five? Okay, stressful situation. And for the, other, for the rest of the people, why do you sleep less than five? Because you can't sleep? Right. Most people, I can't fall asleep or I can't stay asleep. So usually there are, there's issues there. But you definitely need more. So now we're gonna talk about the nervous system. I think most of you probably know because you're the people who brought you probably told you, but I'm a chiropractor. And um, the main thing that we do in chiropractic is look at the nervous system. That's the main thing. When we look at the spine, we want to make sure that everything is aligned. So when I look at you from the side, we want to see a curve in the neck, we want to see a curve in the mid-back, and we want to see another curve in the lower back. So that's a healthy spine from the side, and obviously from the front, you want it to be straight. If you see something like this, and you start losing the curve in your neck, do you guys know that just losing the curve in your neck is actually shown to decrease your uh, the quantity of your life by about 14 years. This is called an acquired kyphosis. It stretches your spinal cord. Over time, your spinal cord actually starts to die. Definitely shown to increase your risk for anxiety, depression, and sleep disorders. Just this. That chart is up there. Some of the first things that I said was chiropractic is not about back pain. That's what those books are all about. This chart actually shows the relationship between your spine and your body. So another question, what's the, uh, we talked, question number two was, uh, what was question number two? What is health, right? Function. Yeah. What controls your function? Question number three. Your brain. Your brain. You got it. You get like an A plus today, my friend. <laughs> but your brain, so your brain goes down your spine as the spinal cord and then it exits through the nerves and it goes to every single cell, organ, tissue, system of your body. Your immune system, your metabolism, your blood pressure, your cholesterol levels, your digestion, you name it, it's controlled by your nervous system. Now what happens if we put pressure on the nervous system? Anybody? Like a roadblock. Yeah, exactly. It's like a roadblock. A plus plus now. Go <laughs> so back to this. Now this is what this is called, okay? So once your spine gets all crooked, it goes out of alignment, it pinches the nerves in the spinal cord. The proper term for this is a chiropractic subluxation, okay? It means a displaced joint causes pressure on the nervous system, ends up affecting your health in some way. The term is actually pretty neat. Sub means less than. Lux means light. So less than light, right? So I mean, the way I look at it is it's almost like a dimmer switch. When you get a subluxation in your spine, it's turning down the power that's coming from your brain going out to your body. And we have cases like this all the time where once we start making corrections to the spine, blood pressure regulates, digestion improves, breathing improves. We've had people with COPD and ulcerative colitis and you name it, people have gotten great results just from this. There's the subluxation we we're talking about. Now, one, I'm gonna share a story with you guys. What time is it, by the way? That's 10 minutes after seven. Okay, not too bad. All right. <laughs> so, um, I guess it was maybe 16 years ago. Um, so this one guy got incredibly, incredibly sick, all of a sudden, not with it anymore, here we go. So all of a sudden, was totally healthy, thought he was totally healthy, worked out, ate well, did all these different things, and all of a sudden he woke up, couldn't breathe, skin literally got gray like this, when I say gray, I mean gray, couldn't walk up a flight of stairs, basically had to take Ventolin all day long, every single day, 
saw a bunch of specialists, was diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension. His only option was a heart and double lung transplant. He said, if you don't do it, you're gonna be dead in six months, get your stuff in order. And even if you do it, your chance of survival is whatever, 5%. And you probably won't live five years after the surgery. Great, awesome, fun to hear, right? Um, so he decided not to do that, looked for different options. Started seeing a chiropractor who found that he had subluxation in the upper part of his back. Let's look at that chart again. I said heart and lungs, right? Heart and lung transplant. He had subluxation in the upper part of his back. So these are nerves that are going to the heart and the lungs. He had zero back pain. None. Absolutely zero. But he had heart and lung issues. So after he saw the chiropractor, they did the corrective care plan, they corrected his subluxations, he went back to see a specialist, was retested for everything, and everything was normal, and they were scratching their heads, and he said, we've never seen this with anybody with your condition, what did you do? So said, well, I saw a chiropractor. And he said, okay. And so they talked in the office, the specialist's office, for two hours with the doctor, how often do you think most people get to spend two hours with a specialist? Maybe that's why you have to wait six hours for your appointment sometimes. But two hours, and at the end of the conversation, the specialist basically just said, maybe, I don't know. We don't know anything about it. So that's my dad, who's now alive and very healthy. Um, and they now, he went to uh, the Cleveland Clinic and they wanted to do research with this. The problem with that is most research is funded by pharmaceutical companies. So they can't get funding for it. <coughs> because there's no money in fixing that with you know, some adjustments and getting people better. But yeah, I was, um, I was in my early 20s when that happened, or just around 20 years old, I guess. And I can't even tell you like the difference that I saw all of a sudden. And I know there's people here I know you guys have had friends or family members or whatever that have had similar experiences. Like, they're really <coughs> fine. I don't know what happened. I told you this story when you first came in. So that's why I do what I do. Um, do you have a question? How does the, how does the chiropractor diagnose the subluxation? Like, mainly with, mainly with palpation and that's the main is it way we easy do it. To diagnose? If you're trained, yeah. I mean, so the chiropractors are, we can examine just like MDs do. We do orthopedic tests, we test motor, sensory reflexes, all these different things. But the main thing is we test for joint restriction and just motion of the joints. So when you have subluxation in your spine, the joints are stuck, they don't move. That's what causes the inflammation of the nerves, and that's what causes the dysfunction of the organs. Or the cells or the tissues, wherever it is. So um, if you haven't had your spine checked ever, this is why I do, this is the gift. The gift is not the dinner. I'm glad you guys are eating for free, that's cool. But the gift is the gift of health. And I'm serious when I say that. So because you guys came here, we're doing a special. It's 20 bucks to come in and get checks. That's it. When I leave, the offer leaves with me. So if you don't book today, and you decide to come in in a month, it goes back to a regular fee. Um, we decided to do something else today because we really want to start focusing more on getting kids checked because your first trauma is the birth process. Most kids come out, the doctors are pulling with, you know, up to 120 pounds of pressure sometimes. It only takes 140 pounds to actually decapitate a child. And they pull up to 120, it only takes 90 pounds to tear tissue. So some kids have damage day one. And that's when you see colic, they can't nurse, they have they have constipation issues, they can't sleep, they're crying constantly. It's not normal for babies to cry constantly, just so you guys know. People tell you that while well, their babies are supposed to cry. Yeah, they cry a little bit, but not constantly like that. Um, so for families, we're doing the whole family for 40 bucks. 20 for you, 40 for the family, that's it. And it's a checkup. There's no commitment, there's no nothing. So that's all it is. Um, I hope you guys learned a lot. I hope you have a lot of questions. And um, if you don't come in, I, I wish you the very best. And I hope you 
take some of this information and you apply it to your life. Um, and other than that, I hope you enjoy the food and be blessed. different, you know, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. Uh, so what the problem is when those get out of whack. Yeah. And that's during stress, right? Is that well, here's the other thing. So I'm going to bring this up really quick for you guys. So I'm a big believer that the body doesn't make mistakes. If my blood pressure goes up, it's going up because there's a requirement for it to go up. If my fever goes up, or if I get a fever, it's going up for a reason. I'm not just walking down the street and all of a sudden a fever spikes, right? What's the fever there for? To kill something. Why would I bring it down unless it's, sometimes your body goes a little too aggressive at times, very seldomly though, and you can go into a little bit of a seizure. But most of the time you're fine. So whether it's a fever, whether it's blood pressure, whether it's cholesterol levels going out of whack or hormones going out of whack, the body's doing something. It's trying to adapt to a certain stressor. So even Hans Selye, you guys familiar with Hans Selye? So you basically talked about how the body tries, you go under stress and tries to adapt, then you fail to adapt, and then you die. Once you lose the ability to adapt, that's when you die. 